All right, so welcome everybody. I'm Dr. John Saunders. For those of you that are watching the video of this, I'm a lecturer in the communication arts department, and this is the first guest speaker that we have in my class on public memory and race in the South. And so today we have our first guest speaker, Dr. Christine Sears, who's an associate professor in the Department of History here at UAH. And she's gonna be talking about lynchings that have happened in the past and how that works for us in the present as well as historical markers. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Sears. Hello everyone, it's really nice to be with you today. Uh, although I have to say that this topic really is a topic that makes me feel so angry and filled with rage, which is an interesting experience when you're looking at the past. Obviously, all of this has already happened and also depressed. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a tough topic. What can you say? I, I would also say that my preferred method of talking with y'all is to make it a conversation. So I know it's a little awkward on Zoom, but I would appreciate you just interrupting if you have a question or if you have a comment that you want to talk about. So this can be as interactive as as y'all would like for it to be. And what I wanted to do today was really talk about um, lynching in historical context. So kind of putting it in uh, the context of the past, like how and why did it happen or what was the thing that happened? Because one of the things that I think is interesting is that lynching predated the Civil War. Like lynching is not anything new. We people, you know, act as vigilantes throughout history. But lynching before the, pri the prior to the Civil War used to meant somebody got beaten or whipped. It very, very, very rarely ended in death. So it's after the Civil War that lynchings take this really brutal turn and lynchings involve not only death, but torture. And, and I think we just need to call that out. It's, it's torture. And I wonder why, why do you guys think there might have been that huge watershed moment that before the Civil War, it's beating or whipping, after the Civil War, it's literally torturing and death. I think there was, um, during the Civil War, a lot of anger um, that kind of was very prevalent and it was a lot more uh, loud rather than something that was kind of not as quiet, I guess, if that makes sense. I don't know how, what exact words to use, but it, it feels like the Civil War had a lot of um, very loud anger involved in it. Samantha, do you have a sense of what that anger was about? I, I think you're absolutely right. It's a really loud, vehement anger. Um, there were, there was a lot of, um, Firstly, just anger that came out of being tired of things, a lot of uprisings. And then also there was a lot of pride behind the anger of feeling like we have the right to be angry about these things and being angry at people saying you can't be angry about those things, um, specifically with race um, behind white people and behind black people and other minorities in America. What are people angry about? Well, the economy for white people <laughs> and saying, you know, we have the right to, in the South, we have the right to um, keep our economy and by uh, having, what's the word? It's too early for this, but by, having, by freeing slaves, you know, you would be destroying our economy and we have the right to be angry about that. Um, but for black people, it was, we have the right to be free and be free people and free citizens. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Samantha. Any other thoughts about what might cause that break that the Civil War is a big time of change about lynching? Well, was race a primary factor before the Civil War? No. Because I've seen plenty of movies where, you know, you get a, a mob together because somebody did somebody else wrong. And so it was, or at least to my limited understanding of it, race wasn't a primary factor before the Civil War. It was just, all right, 
somebody stole or somebody assaulted somebody they shouldn't have. So let's go get them and teach them a lesson. Whereas Absolutely. after the Civil War, there was a target that it wasn't the individual, it was a demographic that was being attacked more so than anything the individual had actually done personally. I think that's absolutely accurate. So it's that demographic that gets hit. And what I wanted to do is kind of, again, focus on that difference, that difference in the post-Civil War, looking at lynching and uh, what Mark Twain called the states of lyncherdom. So Mark Twain was so concerned that lynching was so uh, prevalent after the Civil War. And he's, of course, living in the early 1900s that he calls it the state of lynchardom. So this is a long term problem. This is a problem lynching of African-Americans, of people who are uh, black after the Civil War, all the way into the 1950s, all the way into Emmett Till. And in fact, it's not until recently that they managed to pass an anti lynching bill in Congress, despite the fact that they've been trying or some people have been trying since the 1880s. So this is a long-term problem that after the Civil War was specifically targeted to terrorizing Af African-Americans. And it's specifically targeting, targeting African-Americans because after the Civil War, there are 4 million free men and women in this country. And they're living in a society, and I hate to say this, but this, this is true North and South, East and West in the United States that was racist. And I want to say that again, the United States together was racist. And so when we have freedmen that are trying to integrate into the society that was based on racial hierarchies, based on racial distinctions, that caused some anger in white people. And normally I would say anger can be justified, but in this case, I'm not sure. <laughs> particularly given that research indicates that white planters had maintained their economic standing after the Civil War. So it took them very few years to maintain their economic holdings, to keep things running. And they did that in a large way through terror exercised over African-American bodies. So lynching becomes a ritualized way of terrorizing people who are black. And I have some slides I kind of want to use. So I'm not going to be able to see y'all. So again, if you want to talk, please just feel free to interrupt. Um, and this, again, is to show that it's a long term problem. It's not just after the, after the Civil War, but this is a 1910 lynching. And I don't know if you can make out that there is an actual lynched body in this postcard. This is a postcard, you guys. People would go to lynchings, uh, you know, for, can I say shits and giggles? Um, for, for fun, and then you could buy a postcard and send it to people. There's a um, horrifying site that has these postcards and it has both sides. So you can see the picture and then you can see the note somebody wrote. And on this one, somebody wrote like something like, you'll never guess what happened at lunch. I, this whole thing happened and you know, and I, I want you to notice who's in the crowd. Who's in this crowd? Can you pick out any faces or types of people? I think something important to, to note is that a lot of them are kids, um, which is surprising. Like the first two you see are kids, and then I think there's a little girl like right behind them. So it's something that is seen as normal for them to have like kids around it. Um, I think that's very important to know. And then I don't know. Um, I think most of them are white. I don't know if the guy. It might just be the, um, the the picture. Yeah, I don't know if he is white or not. But I that person you're pointing at. Um, that's a question I had with the bike. They look like a bunch of businessmen. It does, doesn't it? And look at the business people like crowding the business windows. Yeah. So just, you know, a, a, a normal activity that you would have for lunchtime. And again, this is just to kind of help us think about this long term. So I want to look briefly at the civil, the reconstruction period, briefly at scientific racism, I think is a real reason for uh, lynching and disenfranchisement and Jim Crow. And then I wanna look more carefully at lynching. So I'm gonna bop through the first parts, but that's what I wanna look at. And of course, reconstruction is the period after the Civil War between 1865 and 1877. And I think what 
the United States was grappling in this time period was what is, what is freedom worth and what does freedom mean? Particularly in the South, where the vast majority of African Americans lived at the time. Obviously forcefully, right? They were constrained to the South by their enslavement. Most African Americans also were lived in rural areas. Frankly, most Americans did. Cities don't play a large role in American life until 1920. Um, but they're, they don't, as African Americans, as enslaved people, have control over their own bodies. They don't have control over the fruits of their own labor. And after Reconstruction, one of the fears that white people had is that blacks would rise up and kill them. And one of the things that it's extremely perhaps surprising then is what overwhelmingly African Americans wanted was to find their family members who had been sold away from them in slavery and to get an education and to be able to economically support themselves. There are virtually no cases of African Americans trying to exert any type of vengeance or harm. And as you can see in this Harper's cover, Harper's Weekly, they want to have their families. They spend enormous amounts of energy trying to recreate and reconstitute the families that have been sold away from each other in slavery. They spend a lot of energy going to school and the stories are just heartbreaking where you have African Americans setting up schools and people who are in their 80s and people who are in their 50s go to school at night after they work all day alongside their children because they wanna learn how to read. And very often what they wanna learn how to read particularly is the Bible. So they want to be able to read it for themselves. So African Americans are trying to take control of their lives and uh, whites are still angry and fearful. And, and I think that's an important dichotomy to set up. Now during reconstruction, we have three really key amendments that are passed that affect all Americans, but particularly African Americans. The 13th amendment freed all slaves and outlaws slavery forever in the United States. Yay, one really positive thing about Reconstruction. The 14th Amendment says that all Americans who are born here or naturalized, all of them are citizens, which includes African Americans, are have the right of due process as per the Constitution and equal protection of the laws. The 15th Amendment gives everybody who's a citizen of the United States, a right to vote that cannot be abridged or denied based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. I would say, yay, but I feel like that last one, we're still fighting the good fight. And certainly we're still fighting that good fight up through the 1950s and 1960s when you have the civil rights movement that you'll talk about more in that period. Now, all of these sound fairly good, but the problem is that in 1877, because of big political realignments, the federal government pulls out of the South and without the federal government to enforce these laws, the laws are not followed. So as soon as the federal government moves out of the South, the South moves to disenfranchise and terrorize African-Americans, which they can do with impunity because there's no enforcement. The, re the uh, reconstruction period also involves readmission to the Union and all of these states have to uh, be readmitted to the union. And the basic thing that they have to do is they have to agree that these are amendments to the constitution that they will follow, which they immediately don't follow after 1877. And I want you to keep this map in mind because uh, you can see where all the, the deep South states are, where cotton is the main crop, cotton being grown primarily by enslaved laborers because when you see the map of lynching, I think you'll see a crazy amount of overlap that it's the former Confederate states that are involved in lynching primarily over time. So the recon- I have, a, I have a question about Virginia. Yeah. It says that their date of readmission to the union was 1870, but their date of reestablishment for conservative government was a year before that. So they had their state, the state government is the one that's reconstituted as a conservative government. 
as opposed to the 1870s, there right, was right. readmission to the Union states. So they had the state government that they had already gotten conservatives in office. And conservatives here means former Confederates. Gotcha. <laughs> it okay. takes a little longer in other places. Great question. Any other questions or comments, you guys? So unfortunately, Reconstruction, uh, particularly the end of Reconstruction, coincided with very clear ideas about racism. And it's also, if, it's often called scientific racism because uh, racism was underwritten or undergird by the science of the day. And this is, I think, a very interesting thing about science, that science can often, often be used in a cultural way. And one of the main proponents, but certainly not the only proponent of scientific racism was a guy named Hen Lewis Henry Morgan, who wrote, wrote a book called Ancient Society. And there's a lot of words up here, but what it boils down to is that most uh, Westerners, so this is Europeans and Americans, believed that um, societies advanced through stages and you can see those stages here. So first you start as savages and you use bow and arrows. Then you move to barbarism. You might make pots and you might domesticate some plants and animals and might use some iron, Native Americans, for instance. And then you have civilization. At least we have, at last we have arrived at being Greek. And we have writing and phonetic alphabet and art and all those things that Westerners associated with um, civilization. Um, the best civilization was Greek and what they called Anglo-Saxon Protestant, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. You've probably heard that abbreviated as, as WASP, right? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And Anglo-Saxon was a reference to Germany. Many people in the West believed that the greatest strains of democracy and good civilization came from the forests of Germany, went to England, and then came to the new world and became the United States of America. Yay! Okay, so the way that you, sh you prove that you're civilized is uh, you've gone through those stages as, as a civilization. You've got the right gender roles. That was really important. So men do what Western white culture thinks they should do, and women does do what white Western cultures think they should do. You have a certain type of government, you have a certain type of uh, writing, all of those things. And that's what, what you wanna see from a Western point of view. I think the danger in this, I mean, there are many dangers here, obviously, but the danger is that, that here is science, right? In quotes, proving that African-Americans and other races, races are naturally inferior. They're morally inferior. They're intellectually inferior. Of course, this bonds really well with social Darwinism of the 1900s. And it leaves very little hope in the Western mind that African-Americans or other races can improve. So in the 1880s, many scholars, and I'm talking about white scholars clearly, and there are African-American scholars at the time that would vehemently and did vehemently disagree. But a lot of white scholars viewed African-Americans as quote, a race that was devolving on the scale of civilization and becoming increasingly dangerous. So let me restate that. Not only did quote unquote scientists believe that African-Americans were naturally inferior they believed that they were actually getting worse and their genetics and everything were devolving, going backwards in the scale of evolution. And the fear was that this would drag white American society down. And one evidence of this that scientists and others used was the idea of the black beast. And the black beast is a quote from the period this is not a terminology that I would use, I wanna assure you. But in the time period, this phrase black beast was thrown around a lot by scientists, in the media, by regular people. And the idea of a black beast was that African-American men were out of control. They couldn't control themselves. They couldn't control their passion, passions. They weren't very intelligent. They were ape-like. 
They wanted to get vengeance. And how did white people imagine they would get that vengeance? Well, they would imagine that they would do it by raping white women. I don't know about you, but I find this to be a very strange conclusion. But at the time it made total sense. They're concerned about the, the um, continuance of the white race. Remember that in the early 1900s, more and more women were getting educated and educated women tended to delay their marriage and the kids that they had. So women are having fewer kids. And this fear of race suicide, that's also a phrase from the time period, that white women weren't having enough white kids was going to kill off the white race. And meanwhile, the belief was that African-American women could get pregnant just by thinking about sex and that they did not have any pain in childbirth. Pair that with the idea that black men are crazy for sex, they're hypersexual, and they have no control over themselves. And you get this idea that maybe black men all just want to rape white women. This is really depressing. <laughs> Finding this hard to talk about. Uh, this also coincides with something you may have heard of called eugenics. And I'm going to spell that because for reasons I don't understand, I didn't put this on my slide. So eugenics is E-U-G-E-N-I-C-S. And eugenics is the idea uh, in the early 1900s, people were, were thinking that we can create a better race, right? And we can create a better race by making sure that the right people have babies with the right people. And one can imagine that the hierarchical society with white people on top means white people. So have you guys ever seen like baby competitions, the cutest babies and stuff like that? All of that was about promoting eugenics. They're almost all beautiful little white children with cherubic little faces. And they used to in the 1920s and 1930s also have uh, competitions for the best family. And they would all be white strapping family members, you know, and that's all part of that eugenics. All of this scientific racism then is used to show that African-Americans lack higher intelligence, they lack self-control, and therefore they shouldn't be allowed to vote. So when Southern states and some Northern states start disenfranchising African-Americans, and in some cases that's adding uh, literacy tests or secret ballots, and literacy tests were given differently to different participants. So in other words, if you were a white person, you would be given one literacy test in Alabama. If you were a black person, you would be asked to interpret the state constitution. I don't know if you've looked at the state constitution of Alabama. It's the longest constitution in the country. Some of the language is impenetrable. White people can't figure it out. Black people were asked to translate that language in written tests in several pages. Some of these tests are online and they're fascinating to look at. They also started using poll taxes where you had to pay to vote. And I recently read, like, let's say, let's say that I was, uh, I had a poll tax that I had to pay and only black people had to pay poll taxes in most states, although in some states it applied to everyone. So it, it disenfranchised some poor white people. So let's say that I owed a, a $10 poll tax one year to vote and I couldn't pay it. So I just didn't vote. So next year I go to vote. The poll taxes in most states worked that I had to pay the cumulative tax. So I would have to pay the $10, $10 from last year and I would have to pay the $10 from this year if I wanted to vote in the current election. So these were very, very uh, helpful ways from a white point of view to disenfranchise black voters, which they're saying is um, needed because African-Americans you know, aren't as smart and aren't as advanced. This also, I think, justified Jim Crow laws. And I would say that the 1896 Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson, which ruled that separate was fine. So we can have different laws for blacks. We can have different schools for blacks. We can have different railroad cars for blacks uh, because they're seen as, as dragging down civilization. And Jim Crow laws were certainly white, North and South, East and West. So again, this is a national issue. <laughs> 
So I hope I've made a case that in Reconstruction, a lot of ideas about African Americans got forged. And remember that those 4 million freedmen are suddenly worth nothing to white Southerners. If you're enslaved, you're like, what's a fancy car you guys can think of? You're like a Tesla. If you're a prime slave hand, you're like a Tesla to your owner. And owners certainly didn't treat their slaves wonderfully, but they had some interest in your body. They had some interest in your life. After the Civil War, when all of those 4 million people are freed, they have no interest in your body. They have no interest in your life. And they have a lot of fear and anger about you voting, getting a job, owning a property. And I think that's where the lynching comes in. And if you tie that with scientific racism, with eugenics, it's a dangerous mix. And that's why I think you see so many people lynched. Can you guys kind of pinpoint the high point of lynching? Eighteen ninety-two. Yeah, it looks like spot on there. Eighteen ninety-two. Anybody notice that one particular demographic, as John said, was lynched more than other demographics? That's a really stupid question. I know African Americans are clearly lynched more. Um, and keep in mind that lynching is extra legal. It's not legal. It's going around legal procedures. And the most common accusation made against lynched African-Americans, particularly men, was that they had raped a white person. Again, that black beast fear has very, very, very clear real life implications for African-Americans. Now I said that it's an excuse and I think that's important to keep in mind. It's an excuse. It's a bogus charge, in other words. So I would say that lynching is about keeping African-Americans terrorized so they can't get economic self-sufficiency and they aren't a part of the body politic in the United States by voting. I wanna show you a Harper's cover from this time period. Can you guys make out who's involved here? Let me see, this one is from 1868. So it's fairly new after the Civil War. Who do you guys think this is representing a group of people it's representing? Uh, I'd hate to say it, but um, is it representing the African American people? No, but that's a super good guess. Ooh. It's a super good guess, and and I'm I'm wondering if you're looking at the ape-like features. Um, does his hat say S point, and then his little bat says a vote? Five um, points. Good five reading. Point. Yeah, I'm having a hard time distinguishing what he's supposed to to be or like who he's supposed to be. But the other people I get. So what do you see here? Well, let me go back to this guy. Five Points is a really famous area in New York where Irish people congregated. So this is an Irish person and Irish people were the backbone of the Democratic Party in the North. A lot of Irish immigrants came to this country right around the time of the Civil War, right before the Civil War. and. And you might notice that there are racial ideas about <laughs> Irish people. So wasps, white American, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants were fairly free with racial stereotyping. And they saw Irish people as not civilized, as also barbaric uh, 
and uh, they're just representing a vote. So the thought was that the Democratic Party was just like dragging them along. You know, Irish people weren't that bright, but they're a vote. This guy is uh, the, see the CSA there? That stands for Confederate States of America. And I don't know if you can make this out, but his sword says the lost cause. And I find that fascinating that they're already talking about the lost cause idea in 1868. So here you have the Confederate States of America with his whip. And this is a Northern merchant who's got capital and wanting votes and all of them are stepping on an African-American. And I don't know if you can make this out in the back, but there's an African-American who's been lynched on a light pole back here in a city. So what do you think is the message here? Maybe you can make out what it says on the top, for instance. Basically white people are in charge. And we're gonna keep the African-American down. Um, I'm gonna have an aside here. This very, I think, accurate political cartoon was created by a guy named Thomas Nast. And Thomas Nast is the guy who invented our image of Santa Claus when he illustrated C. Clement Moore's poem about Santa Claus uh, in the post-Civil War period. So Thomas Nast, Thomas Nast also invented the images of the, right, the um, elephant and the donkey that represent the political parties. So super important guy <laughs> in terms of things. This is a, another image from the time period from a newspaper. And I think you can see that um, the idea was that, that between the KKK and other white supremacist group that the post reconstruction post-Civil War period was worse than slavery for, for African-American families in some ways. And here you have another lost cause reference. So what I'm trying to put together here is that lynching is part and parcel of white people trying to keep the upper hand over those freed African-Americans. There are 360 documented Alabama lynchings between Reconstruction and the 1950s, I think. Across the United States, there are 4,000 in that period. And the problem with documenting lynchings is a lot of them weren't documented. Although what's interesting about lynchings is they did draw crowds and they sometimes, they often took pictures, which again, seems really weird, but. I think the fact that they're taking photographs, you guys pointed out the fact that kids attended lynchings and that was not uncommon. Lynchings were sometimes a place where you had a barbecue and you drank lemonade and you had a big party. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And I think again, Thomas Nast pinpoints the reason. If you lynch a black man, that's one vote less. Here's a lynching going on in the background and the perception of many Northerners, some Northerners, was that justice is asleep while these extra legal vigilante lynchings are going on. I want to have a small aside here again. I don't know if you've ever heard of a, a Tracer, Spencer Tracy movie called Fury. It was made in the early 1900s, I want to say. I'd have to look up the date because it was made by a, a filmmaker named Fritz Lang and Fritz Lang left Nazi Germany. So it would have to be in the 1930s at the very earliest, right? And Fritz Lang was married to a woman who was really excited about Nazis and who was involved in the Nazi party. And so Fritz Lang had to leave his wife secretly and he came to the United States and to learn English in the United States, stick with me, it seems like a shaggy dog story, but there's a payoff. <laughs> He, he rode buses around California to learn English. And he was on more than one bus where the bus driver would hear there was a lynching of a black man and divert the whole bus so they could all watch the lynching. And Fritz Lang wanted to make a movie about it, but there were laws about movie making in the time period where you couldn't show that type of African-American focus. You couldn't show violence like that. So he made Fury. So Fury so shows, uh, Spencer Tracy's character being attacked by a mob when he's in jail. Spencer Tracy, Tracy is clearly a white man, 
but he wasn't, Fritz Lang wasn't allowed to make the movie he wanted to make. He was trying to talk about the rule of mobs. And here you can see that rule of mobs going on with just as asleep and not able to do anything about it. So recently people have started really working with the Equal Justice Initiative to mark some of these lynchings. Here's a marker from Tuscaloosa that annotates about eight lynchings done over time from 1884 into the early 20th century. I don't know if you can read some of those. Notice here they, they both hang and shot after this man was alleged to have opened the, entered the home of a white woman. Over 100 white farmers hung and also shot this man after he was accused of assaulting two white women. So the, the rape and attempted rape is often the excuse. Here's a map that shows those lynchings. I don't know if you notice any overlap with the Confederate States of America. And usually the lynchings were reported in the press, both North and South, as death by parties unknown. And part of the excuse that was used by whites, and this was picked up unfortunately by the media, was that white people had to lynch black people because the law wasn't taking care of the issue. So we have these black rapists who are loose, white people feel like it's a necessary evil. And even though the whole community knew who had done the lynching, everybody knew it was often huge groups. People were often not masked. They were having picnics. Everybody would say, I don't know who did it. It was done by parties unknown. I have no idea. And I wanna give you a couple of examples of some particular lynchings, just to again, break this down. Here's one in Selma. And I, I wanted to show the markers as part of this conversation because this has definitely become in, this is when it was put up in 2018. Since about 2016, I think these lynchings have been, these markers have been going up more, more and more often. I'm gonna give you a minute just to read through those. I don't know, this is when I start feeling beat up in this presentation. This is just hard to talk about. Do you guys feel also beat up? There's a lot of text there, but why were the lynchings carried out there at the end? What kind of people were lynched and why? People who tried to change kind of the way that things were, it looks like, like fought against inequality based on race in the South. Fought against the terribly racist economic institution of sharecropping. There was another famous lynching in 1892 in Memphis that I wanna talk about briefly. And it was um, a man named Thomas Moss and his business partners who were lynched. And Thomas Moss and the other men obviously were African-American who had opened a grocery that they called the People's Grocery in 1889 that was very nearby a white grocery and competed very well against that white grocery. So this very prosperous black business was um, attacked by whites wielding guns in 1892. The African-American business owners obviously responded. I mean, a bunch of white men ran into the store with guns. So there was kind of a fight out. Well, it turned out that some of the white people who had run into their store with guns were plain clothes sheriffs. And so they arrested the African-Americans for attacking sheriffs, even though they had not announced that they were sheriffs. 
and they were not dressed as sheriffs. So after the three black men were put into jail, a crowd obviously lynched them. It seems really clear that this was a case of economic equality and not a case of racism. And after the three men were arrested, whites plundered and totally destroyed their grocery store. Now, it just so happened that one of Thomas Moss's dear friends was a woman named Ida B. Wells. And why Ida B. Wells is here on the left. And she was a very, very famous speaker from Memphis, Tennessee, African-American, obviously, who wrote editorials. Um, and she helped uh, launch an action against lynching in the United States. One of the things she did in Thomas Moss's case is that she helped African-Americans put together a boycott of white businesses. And one of the businesses that they hurt the most was streetcars. Black riders pretty much kept streetcars in business. And she encouraged the community to completely boycott white businesses because of the lynching of, the, of Moss and his, his uh, business partners. And they were so successful that the streetcar company went to Ida, Ida Wells and said, look, can you help us out? We think black people are afraid of streetcars. And if you could just tell them that streetcars are safe. So you see how the white business owners like worked with that scientific racism. They started thinking like, oh, it's not that they're boycotting us because we're racist and we killed three of their community members. It's because they're afraid of streetcars. She also published in the early 1900s, a red record which documented lynchings in the United States. And one of the really fabulous thing about Miss Wells was that she used the scientific method. So she investigated each lynching. She investigated the charge of rape. She showed that those charges were bogus. And then she went to England and talked about lynching there. And people in England were like, what the heck? She would show them postcards that people would send of lynchings with those little children in them. And, and people in England were like, what? So Americans started looking a little bad in the world. And I think that was really, really smart on Miss Wells' part that she used her power and the power of her pen and the power of her speeches I cannot overstate, if you get a chance to read them, they're wonderful. She also, almost single-handedly, her story is amazing, by the way, in general, from start to finish. But she also led the way to get Memphis African-Americans to move north and west. She said, look, if we can't get fairness, if we can't get equality, if we're lynched here in Memphis, let's start supporting, let's stop supporting these white businesses and let's leave town. So she personally led hundreds of black Memphisans, Memphis, I don't know what you call them, to Oklahoma. <laughs> and this is the beginning of the Great Migration where African-Americans seek greater freedom, seek non-lynching in the North and in the West. Unfortunately, the North and the West also was pretty racist. So this had mixed results, but they weren't lynched as often. This is a um, postcard of a lynching crowd and I didn't wanna show you the whole crowd, but I just wanted to show you that there's a, a little girl here. I couldn't find a good Im image of this on the spur of the moment, but I know I've seen images where there are beautiful, beautiful, like look like six-year-old girls with blonde curls who are next to bodies being lynched. And I wanna just say that this is a crowd of 10,000 in Waco, Texas in 1916. And the crowd here included families, city officials and policemen. And for two hours, for two hours, they raised and lowered the body of Jesse Washington, a black farmhand, a teenager, raised and lowered his body over a fire. So they would lower him into the fire so his body was burnt and then they would pull him out and then they would lower him down into the fire so that his body was burnt. And they sold pictures of that in postcards. It was not uncommon for lynch mobs 
to cut off body parts and save them as trophies. And yet the media, North and South, would say, we're lynching people because we're half to. They would say, and I'm quoting, that Negroes were lynched by a quiet, determined crowd. All evidence the contrary. So this is where I think things like the National Peace and Justice Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama, and those markers are supremely important. I wanna also say that the black press led by Ida B. Wells and others was super important in documenting the reality of these lynching situations. And also I wanna point out that just the threat of lynching was powerful. So Richard Wright, who is a very famous African-American novelist from Mississippi who knew two men, one of him was his uncle who were lynched, wrote, the things that influenced my conduct as a Negro did not have to happen to me directly. I needed but to hear of them to feel their full effects and the deepest layers of my consciousness. Indeed, the white brutality that I had not seen was a more effective control of my behavior than that which I knew. So I don't know if you have any thoughts, comments, or, or questions, uh, or if you just want to vomit to the side. <laughs> well, I do find it interesting to think about some of the narratives from the time period that you've talked through and who wrote those and how they were written because that was part of what this cl entire class is about looking at public memory and there were people who were trying to preserve this as here's what we have done and would use words like you talked about giving it a, you know, a quiet mob and the unknown and almost trying to champion it. Whereas now that we're historically removed from that era and more truth is known, the stories are so very different today while each one was trying to do similar work to try to make an audience think in certain ways. So yeah, I, I think it's really interesting the way narratives are being used to influence a public to think certain ways about these particular acts especially, you know, a hundred years apart from each other. Not to get like overly political, but I feel like this does very much overlap into modern day media narratives. Like just as an example in the 2016, I think it was 2016 Ferguson riots, the media was showing a lot of images of like black people going into buildings and looting and rioting and burning things down. Whereas people who were actually there were sharing images that showed a very different demographic where it was equally distributed by race in a lot of instances that the media did not at all show. So I think this is a very good example of why we should be critical of the media even now and try to get different perspectives on events rather than just taking for face value what words were being told. Well, and I think it's also interesting, I mean, as Dr. Sears has gone through all of this, to me, it seemed like the Nazis were reading the Confederate playbook because what they did cr creating pseudoscience about Jews 
and claiming that the bumps on their head, you could tell that they were inferior because of that. And so many th ways that the narratives were controlled. I mean, it's almost like a replication of what was going on here in the US in Germany. It's absolutely a replication. The Germans invited a lot of American scientists to visit Germany prior to Hitler getting power. And they worked with American eugenicists because they admired how well eugenicists were working in the United States. So most states, uh, by the time you get into the 1930s, had laws against allowing certain people to reproduce. Prostitutes weren't supposed to have kids. People who were quote unquote imbeciles weren't supposed to have kids. And the states had a great deal of latitude to say who is an imbecile. And, and you can imagine that Native Americans and African Americans were often labeled imbeciles. They were forcibly sterilized. There were laws in many states that allowed the government to forcibly sterilize you. And the famous Supreme Court case that made that finally and absolutely legal in the United States was uh, Buck versus Bell. And Carrie Buck was a young woman who had been in a foster home and she got pregnant as a teenager. And uh, since her mother had been pregnant with her as a teenager, the state declared her an imbecile and forcibly sterilized her and forcibly put her in what was called an asylum for the rest of her life. And said that the state and the Supreme Court decision said three generations of imbeciles was enough because they ruled her child which was an infant, Carrie Buck's child, it was an infant. A social scientist tested that infant and said it was an imbecile as well. And it turns out that Carrie Buck had been raped by a nephew of her foster family. And that's why she had gotten pregnant. Uh, so absolutely the Nazis are building on American know-how. Ooh, that got my dander up. Talking about this makes me crazy. I'm sorry. I do have a quick question about something. Yeah. Um, one of the maps that you showed of where lynchings happened, I think it was from 1936, had a name on it that said the um, Association of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if you knew anything else about that group. You know, I don't. That's an awesome, awesome question, Emily. I know that there were many anti-lynching groups. And um, one of the questions I have is if that was a white group or a black group or if it was integrated. And I don't know the answer to that. Um, great question. One other thing I wanted to point out for you guys, let me see if I can share this, is the Equal Justice Initiative has a fabulous website and I'm gonna see if I can get it up and I don't want that, <laughs> that has some um, interesting videos that you can watch with people who share their experiences. We can watch one if you want. I think it's just a couple minutes long. Here's one of James Johnson remembering his relative who was lynched in 1937 in Alabama. Can come back to that if you want to listen to that, but you could watch it on the on your own time if you'd rather. They also have a fabulous map of lynchings, and they tell you more about it. So see here, they've mapped out all the lynchings that they've documented, and then you can get closer in. So you can click on reported lynchings in Madison in Limestone. Uh, they have a couple of videos about a few of them. So if you want to explore this more, it's something that you can look at. The other thing that I wanted to talk to you about today is a little bit more uh, upbeat. If you want to change gears, I want to just very briefly tell you about um, something that I've been working on. It's still in the beginning stages. And so part of what we're interested in is student feedback. We'd be interested in knowing what your thoughts are. But in putting up historic markers on um, UAH, because UAH used to be a very large plantation. So it was one of the larger plantations in North Alabama that was owned by 
Llewellyn Jones. Um, and he's buried at UAH behind Morton Hall. There's a small cemetery. So one of the things we'd like to do is put up a marker to mark that cemetery. But also, I'm just gonna skip to the chase here. One of the first schools for African-Americans was in North Alabama was on that land. Part of the land that was Avalon Plantation that is now part of campus was owned by Reuben Jones and Shandy Jones. And they started the Jones School in which um, William Hooper Council taught. And William Hooper Council is the founder of Alabama A&M. So we have really interesting stories to tell at UAH. And here you see a map of UAH. And this is, um, let's see, this is Morton Hall. This is the dorms, the honor dorms. And this is a university. And they think, we think, the archaeologist archaeologist we've been working at thinks that the place where enslaved people were buried is up here. We would need more work to document that for sure. That Perkins Jones Cemetery where Llewellyn Jones is out in the back of Morton Hall. The our archaeology class did a dig and found the remnants of the big house where the white masters lived between the nursing building and Roberts Hall. And again, we would have to do more archaeology to figure this out, but the um, slave village we think was down here and that Jones School would have been down here as well. So something I would like to see done is have historic markers put up, particularly about the Joneses because it's a wonderful story. Uh, Shandy Jones moved to Tuscaloosa and becomes one of the first African-American state elected representatives. So uh, it's a nice tie-in, a little more upbeat than the talk we've been having. Just a quick note about that. I was in Benjamin Hawksbergen's class, the like, I don't want to say the lead archaeologist, but the main one that I know of who's done digs on campus. So, um, in the spring of last year, whenever he did the digs looking for evidence of the um, slave cabins along where Holmes Avenue used to run. And we found um, brick fragments, pieces of glass, evidence of like plants that were placed decoratively and aren't native to the area. Oh, wow. Quite a few different artifacts. So that was really, really neat. And Emily is one of my resources for the Jones family. She knows a lot about this. <laughs> Does this, what I've talked about is really from a historical point of view. Do you think it overlaps well with the communications public memory approach you guys are taking in this class? I think so, especially the, um the markers that you showed us of the the ones on campus of University of Alabama and the one in Selma um, because they have text on them brief text talking about general information of what happened and why that marker is there. Yeah and there's a website where you can see all Alabama markers so there's a website where you can get a list of all of them and I'll show you a picture of them if you guys need that. We do, we have a paper to do, so we need to. We well, you will, if you have trouble finding it, let me know. But if you do a Google search, I think you'll find it. Yeah, I'm in the process of crafting a document with websites that have listings of historical markers, monuments, memorials, museums, since they have to write a short paper about each one and then one longer paper about one particular text. And the two readings we had for this past Monday were all about the process to rename streets after Martin Luther King Jr. and the controversy that they would go through and how long that would take to actually get a street renamed or a street named in the first place. So I'd like to ask, this isn't a short process to get a historical marker put up, right? No, it's not. Uh, we, we have one, but it's not put up and it took us a year and a half because you have to go through so many different groups, you know, uh, which is a good process. You want everybody to have a say, you want to have a lot of input, but it's a long process. Well, and a political 
process, I would assume, because of, I mean, we've talked about the difference between the official and the vernacular when it comes to public memory. And since these have to go through that official and the government will slow everything down <laughs> to do it, that it becomes part of the official memory of the state or the city or the area or whatever it, it has to go through so that it takes so much so many different voices coming into play and you have to listen to the pros and the cons and all of that Well, are there any other questions? We have a, a little time left and we've covered a lot of heavy stuff today. So are there any other questions for Dr. Sears about specifically what she talked about or about how what she talks about fits in with the larger vision of the class and how this combination of history and public memory works together. I just had a question about um, that website that you mentioned at the end that had like the videos and also like just like a map of everything. If you could just uh, tell me that website again, please. Sure, and in fact, um, I'll put it in the chat. It's Thank called you. Lynching in America and it's by the uh, Equal Justice Initiative let me get to the chat. And I see Emily has found the interactive marker thing. And um, Justice Initiative is the one who put up the memorial about lynchings in Montgomery. And it's founded by Brian Stevenson, who does a lot of work to get falsely accused people off of death row and keep children being put on death row. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, and if you haven't taken time to look at the EGI's website, there's a lot of incredible information on there with what they're trying to do to take these very hard to talk about parts of Alabama and the larger South's history and bring that into public discourse to say, this is something we need to talk about. And the ways in which they try to interpret what happened in the past for a contemporary audience as well as future audiences. It's really interesting to see the ways that they do that. And so, when we have Michelle Browder, who is a, a tour guide in Montgomery, she is going to talk about the EJI specifically in the Legacy Museum, as well as a few other museums from Montgomery, which are very interesting, especially since you have the Civil Rights Memorial in a block and a half away is the first White House of the Confederacy. So there's a lot of very interesting ways in which memory acts within our own state, especially the way that it's even spatially set up in Montgomery. So are there any other questions? All right, then thank you very much, Dr. Sears. We appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us, especially with such a, a, a difficult subject to talk through. And I'm sure if any of you have any questions that come up later, I'm sure Dr. Sears would be interested in hearing your questions and your opinions. Absolutely. Yeah, so, thank you so much, you all. Yes, this has been very, very informative, very interesting to, to think through all of this. So the next time we get together, we will have our second guest speaker, Dr. Jason Edward Black.
from UNC Charlotte who will talk about the African American heritage tour he used to lead on the University of Alabama and Tuscaloosa's campus. So if there's no other questions, I will see you all later and I can stick around a little bit in case any of you have questions about the paper proposal that's coming up. Thank you.